Welcome everybody to Morning Fuel. Uh, we sure appreciate everybody getting online and, and uh, remoting with us today. Uh, today our guest is uh, Oklahoma Secretary of Health and Mental Health, Jerome Lawfridge. And we're gonna start out by uh, letting him do just a little bit of uh, kind of a lay of the land. So go ahead, Jerome. Hey, good morning, Dave. And uh, everyone in the whole field. So here, uh, here's a quick update on where we stand. Um, and it's, uh, it's interesting as I was thinking about this, if there's one group that doesn't have to be uh, told what a curve looks like, uh, it's our industry. So uh, having watched curves for your entire careers, I suspect of various types, you're probably deeply uh, familiar with uh, the shape of a curve and what it means. And uh, if I were to characterize it right now, um, though we're still in somewhat early days, uh, our curve is flattening. And so what that means is against these key metrics of uh, hospital beds, ICU beds, and perhaps most importantly, ventilators. Uh, those are the three key choke points uh, when you hit a surge. Against that, uh, the trajectory of our curve looks pretty good. And so we have, uh, I'd say ventilators are probably our most important, the most important piece of this equation. And we estimate we have probably about three times more than we would uh, need at a peak of a surge. And so that's good news. Uh, the whole game here is to keep from overwhelming your healthcare system uh, in times of uh, crisis like this, and in particular as you peak. And I think we're gonna be able to do that. Um, therefore, the limiting factors become uh, how well can you access personal protective equipment uh, through our surge to make sure that the frontline healthcare workers uh, stay safe uh, as they're tending for those uh, who have COVID. And, uh, and then having done that, uh, we have the challenge of getting the economy back going. And I suspect we'll spend some time talking about that uh, too, Dave. But um, as it stands right now, and especially over and against some of the experience of the states, most particularly on the coasts, I'd say we, uh, we sit in good stead. I attribute that to a couple of things. One of them is uh, I think folks have taken pretty seriously this uh, principle that says if you will stay distant from your neighbor, uh, your chance of getting this and transmitting it are simply lower. And that's just how this works. And I think folks have responded well in Oklahoma and have taken personal responsibility on some of this stuff. Uh, and it's showing up in the shape of our curve. So that's a, that's a quick update on where I think we stand. Uh, my encouragement, I would be obligated to say is, don't quit just yet. Um, the reopen plans are, uh, are being worked hard right now. Uh, and it's all, you know, we're keen to get back to work. Uh, but don't uh, don't let the foot off of the accelerator at this moment. Uh, keep staying socially distant, and uh, personal hygiene's key. Well, uh, uh, to pick up a little bit on what Jerome said, uh, and I've got a little information uh, that we're going to be posting out on all all of our channels, social media channels. It's some information that uh, actually Donnell from Carter from your office gave us. Uh, there's an excellent website. Uh, uh, part of the Atlantic uh, magazine that uh, gives a great tracker for the U.S. and it's kind of a high high level uh, by the state. We're going to be posting that link out there. There's also uh, probably the best coverage uh, that we could get is the executive order reports that you guys are doing daily. Um, you know, I think I think it's interesting when you look at all this information. You you know, something like in the U.S. that we've tested uh, like 3.3 million people and we've had uh, about 80 plus percent of these people are uh, uh, that were tested were negative. And so these are people that are exhibiting, exhibiting some sort of fever or or some some indicator uh, to be tested. So this would you would think that would skew the population. Uh, yeah, you know, our numbers are yeah. even little sharp. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's sharper. I was going to go ahead and uh, uh, lead into that. Uh, uh, the death, the death toll, unfortunately, uh, in the U.S. is it's still less than a percent and it's less than a half a percent in Oklahoma. So we want, we want to not before we, you know, during this, this uh, show this today, we want to make sure that we applaud the efforts of uh, your, your office, Jerome and, the, and our governor, because I'm looking at these stats this morning uh, from yesterday, um, uh, uh, yesterday's executive order report showing, you know, we have uh, 80, 80 plus percent of our ventilators available. We are really prepared for the peak, which you mentioned uh, earlier. 
when do you think that that, I know you're gonna get asked this a lot, but when do you think that peak is and, and what has that date slid a little bit from the April 22nd, 23rd date? It was a week or so old. It has, you know, one of the consequences of, of flattening a curve is it tends to move the peak a little bit to the right sequentially. So I think realistically now it's, uh, it's toward the end of April and maybe the very end of April when we would estimate uh, that the mathematical peak comes. But the other consequence of a flat curve is, um, you know, the difference between uh, days is, uh, is, is de minimis. And so sometime around the very end of April, very, very first of May, I think we estimate um, hitting a peak. Uh, and again, that would have moved even from a week ago from you know, around the 21st or so of April. But that again is a consequence of flattening the curve, moving the peak a little bit to the right. You know, another, uh, another thing that Oklahoma is doing in the, these, this uh, executive order report is reporting demographics, which a lot of the uh, a lot of the other states are not reporting. And, and I think the glaring part is, is from the death standpoint, unfortunately, it's our population of greater than 65 years old that has 80% of the deaths. And, and gosh, it's, oh, it's mid 90s, roughly for over 50. So it's really a, uh, it's really a, the older folks that, or especially if they have some, some sort of immune deficiency or some other pre-existing condition that that's uh, putting them in danger. Uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about probably the nursing homes and some of the things, the most at risk people, are we taking different precautions there than other places or let, let us know about that? Yeah, we sure are. And um, in fact, if I could blow those numbers out just a little bit more, Dave, we have, um, you know, we, we obviously mourn um, every life that's lost here. Uh, this is a disease that hits the elderly, uh, and really it's the 65 and above cohort. And typically, if you think of something like uh, sort of your standard issue influenza that will, you know, tear through from time to time, particularly virulently, it will have, it will tend to have a barbell effect uh, with the standpoint of mortality, meaning the six-year-old and under cohort will at least exhibit some measure of mortality. We simply haven't seen that with COVID-19. And in fact, looking at the numbers last night, where we have had uh, four deaths that are in uh, that kind of in the 20s and 30s uh, age range. Every one of those had an underlying condition, uh, comorbidity, and it happened that all four of those uh, had diabetes. Um, so from the standpoint of lethality, it, there's just simply no question, it's inarguable that it's the 65 and older and the immunocompromised, immunosuppressed uh, who are most at risk. That translates directly into uh, a case for treating the long-term care and nursing care facilities differently. Uh, it's simply our, that, that's, the, that's the hole in the wall of the defense right now. And so what we're doing about that is a couple of things. One, we, have, we, we literally have strike teams that we're sending in now. And so if a nursing home exhibits a, a positive, they have a positive, uh, we go in with pretty hardcore uh, testing and then sequestration. So keeping folks still in the nursing home, but but moving them to a separate part of the nursing home. Uh, it's already been the case that, um, and, and this, is, this is tough. I know folks are, um, you know, they want to visit their loved ones, but the cessation of visitation at nursing homes was a pretty early step, um, simply because we who have uh, loved ones in nursing care, are, we're just vectors, we're, we're vectors for delivering it. So from the outset, we said no visitation with the exception of end of life visitation. Um, and that's, that's one of those realities we deal with, obviously. So we permit end of life visitation when it's, there's appropriate PPE, uh, disinfecting and the like. Um, but right now, uh, so when a, when a long-term care facility exhibits a positive, uh, we effectively go on lockdown. We test and then sequester those uh, who have tested positive. And then one key thing here is to get PPE to them, personal protective equipment, but also very importantly, you know, several of these facilities, you know, quite, quite obviously are owned by similar ownership groups. And it's really vital that we not have uh, healthcare workers moving in between facilities because, you know, that's, that's a little bee carrying pollen right there. And so those are steps that we're taking specifically around long-term care uh, to try to mitigate uh, the impact there because, Unfortunately, folks who are uh, in that condition um, stand the, the greatest chance of really severe consequences from the virus. 
You alluded to testing, uh, Jerome, and you know, we've tested about 30,000 or so people in Oklahoma. You know, obviously, we're, like we said earlier, we had some sort of indication uh, that, that uh, put them in the group to be tested. Uh, how, how as, as part of, talk about testing in general and about how, how it will, as we start rolling out uh, uh, the economy again, uh, hopefully here in, in May, uh, are we going to stage it in ad adding additional critical uh, things or I can't imagine we're just going to throw the door open, but, but uh, is there a staged aspect to this? What, what yeah. are you guys thinking? There sure is, uh, Dave. And I think in, in the coming days, you'll see more of the stage coming out. So uh, an example is uh, yesterday, the governor announced um, the resumption of some elective surgeries. Um, and even that comes with uh, a staging process. So in that example, there are, there are three tiers uh, that stipulate, um, you know, this sort of procedure can commence April 21st. This sort of procedure can commence May 1st. All of them contingent on the availability of personal protective equipment at an individual institution taken as a microcosm and then expanded across the entire economy. I think that's what you're gonna see. So as an example, and not to jump in front of the governor on this, but to the extent uh, restaurants, as an example, uh, will be in a near-term phase, uh, it will be under the guidance uh, that tables are separate uh, to six feet, that healthcare workers are all in, not in 95 masks, but in you know, ear loop surgical masks, uh, that the total population on the floor of a restaurant would be, you know, would comport with CDC guidance. Uh, we're really, we've, we've ardently followed the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's guidance on how it is and when it is uh, that we, we come back together. We think that's a prudent way to do it. It also takes away some of the, uh, you know, some of just the opinion uh, from this. Uh, to the extent we follow their guidance, we feel like we're on a firm basis of science. So I think you will see uh, in the coming days um, that sort of reopen plan that goes in phases, goes in stages. And frankly, along the way, <clears throat> we keep the curve in mind. And to the extent that the curve starts to move up, well, then we'll constrict. And, you know, I think about this as just, you know, it's choking a well. Um, it's, it's the exact same principle that we would use in our industry. Uh, and you, uh, you know, you watch it and you choke back uh, if, uh, you know, if the flow isn't right. And then you open it up uh, when you're able. And so I think that's the model that you'll see us over the next few months pursue. Oh, your oily DNA is showing, Jerome. I certainly appreciate the, uh, the analogy. Um, uh, is there any uh, advice that you would give uh, that it's not being followed or, or especially for the small businesses, small and large? I'm hearing more and more from the larger businesses that they're they're developing uh, or in the process of developing a protocol of how to bring, you know, stage their employees uh, to return to work. What kind of guidance would you give them on testing? Is it an antibody test? Why don't you maybe kind of demystify the, te the testing versus the immunity versus if there's such a thing right now that they know antibody yep. testing. Kind sure. Of so, for us. yeah, I'm glad you asked that. If I could, uh, if I could, if I could do that real quick, I'll I'll tell you what I've learned about uh, testing in the last uh, in the last six weeks. Um, so tests will come in two types: a PCR test uh, will be the standard issue nasal swab, um, where uh, you know effectively they're going to they're going to stick this swab up your nose until it comes out your ear. Um, it is not uh, by any stretch uh, a pleasant experience, but that's it's it's far back in the nasal cavity uh, that the uh, the virus is going to live. And so that, that is a dispositive test as to your diagnosis, positive or negative. And so when we have these testing centers, when you refer to testing in a hospital setting, that will be a PCR test. Again, it's a real-time test that tells you at the time uh, if you are uh, positive for the virus. You juxtapose that with an antigen test or an antibody test. And an antibody test is drawn from the blood, and it tells you if you have had an immune response. So at some point, have you been exposed to the virus such that your body creates the antibody to the virus? And it can tell you a couple of things. Um, really, it, it says, have you been exposed um, on the one hand? 
Uh, it doesn't tell you if you're, if you're currently symptomatic or anything similar to that. And where it's useful, most useful, is at a population level. So increasingly, and I'll, I'll, I'll highlight one lab uh, in Norman, ME Lab, IMMY, uh, who is really on the forefront of antibody testing. They have just received, well, I should, probably shouldn't say that yet. They're in the process of, uh, uh, of getting approval from the FDA for their testing uh, capacity and protocol. Well, we're going to roll that antibody test out, but it's really useful at the population level so that you can trace and see how the, the virus behaves across the community. So where has it been? And therefore, that allows us to do what we call contact tracing. And that's as simple as saying, if I've carried the antibody, that tells me I've been exposed. And then the epidemiologist in visitation with me can then literally build a tree to say, okay, who else have I exposed? And that's how you mitigate the contact uh, one person to another. And since we're, you know, this is, a, this is an engineering heavy group that we're talking to, you know, there's a factor of transmission. It's called the R naught. And your R factor tells you uh, if I'm positive, how many people am I likely to infect? And so an R naught of 2.5 says I'm, I'm likely to infect two and a half other people. When you have an R naught of one, or rather less than one, then the, the virus dies because I am at the point I'm likely to uh, transmit to less than one person, you've won the game. Well, the antibody test is useful at the population level for helping us to determine how that happens. Um, I would demystify a little bit of this and, and just say uh, a caution for all of us who are chomping uh, to get back to work, and believe me, I'm among them, uh, is it's not, a, it's not a get out of jail free card. Uh, what we don't know yet about this virus, it's referred to as a novel virus because it's new and we don't know its behavior. Um, the presence of antibodies on any individual person's bloodstream uh, is not an indication of immunity at this point. We don't know the level of antibody uh, that has to be present for us to be immune because we haven't been through a second wave of this yet. That'll come in time uh, and again the antibody uh, test is tremendously useful from, from the population standpoint so we can see how it moves. Uh, but uh, folks shouldn't uh, interpret that data incorrectly, which is if I test uh, positive for the antibodies, I'm therefore immune. We can't say that yet scientifically. Uh, and so uh, as people are thinking through where does this fit in the puzzle, I would say it's a great tool for us to use to understand at the community or population level how the virus moves. It's, it's great as well to see who has been exposed because it allows you to take proactive measures to mitigate uh, further spread. It's just not a get out of jail free card. Um, so uh, to use that as a suite of approaches for companies who are thinking about how is it that we return to normal, um, companies can absolutely still comport with CDC guidance by having 10 or fewer people. Uh, we still follow the CDC guidance uh, in recommending that if you're gonna be around those 10 people, wear a surgical mask. Um, uh, the data is if two people standing proximate to one another are both in a surgical mask, it's a vanishingly small um, likelihood that they're going to transmit either to the other. And so if you're going to, you know, if you're, uh, if you're aiming to think, how is it, what protocols do we put in place when we do reopen? Antibody testing can be part of it, but much more importantly is that you stay fewer than 10 people on a floor of a building or in the suite of an office uh, and that, you know, you consider masking up. And uh, those, those things really do mitigate the spread. And then of course, uh, you know, just a heavy dose of disinfecting, uh, it, it, it does, it'll do the job. Uh, of course, everybody in this part of the world is wondering um, the biggest concern for a lot, I mean, I shouldn't say the biggest concern, but we're looking at summer activities for the kids. Uh, we, we, Little League Baseball, our winter gym's going to be open. Uh, are we going to are we going to miss opening day of, of college football? Those are the kinds of things that that uh, may, maybe I know it's more of a you know more of a judgment call for you to to comment, but and I, we're getting your message to be diligent. But uh, as 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 you see as you're watching the trends in these data in the data, do you think that um, uh, we're going to be back to full speed sometime uh, latter part of the year, maybe maybe in time for uh, back to school. Yeah, I, I think if we continue the trend we're on, I think that's a, a real possibility. You know, I've been asked even in recent days about 
hey, advise us on what we should do about summer camp. Um, you know, should we have our June and July gatherings of kiddos? I think it's probably early for us to have enough data to advise around that component. But a fall back to school, a fall, uh, you know, we're going to get our fall classics on the gridiron. Um, you know, I think that's, that's a possibility. I would say uh, generally what I try to do is say, hey, that it really depends on how we act uh, between now and then. Uh, this is a, a unique case where I can't hammer personal responsibility enough on this. And if we exhibit personal responsibility in the near term, it'll pay off come the fall. And I, I know we're all ready for it. Um, so I would say probably anything that anything, uh, any decisions about June and July are probably not reasonably going to be able to be made until mid-May till we see if the uh, curvature uh, of our numbers look, uh, you know, continue like they are. But I think it's reasonable to think that, uh, you know, fall and certainly toward the end of the year that we can get back to something that looks a lot more like, uh, like we're used to. So, so with the antibody testing you were talking about earlier, you know, what it's, what it's indicating is, is that you, uh, you, your, your body has fought, fought off the virus at, at least once. Yeah. There's no guarantee that you won't be attacked again, correct? We don't know. But there's some pretty high profile, uh, uh, one case in particular with, with, um, our, um, uh, with Rand, Rand Paul, uh, he basically said that, that his antibody test indicated that he was, he basically used the word immune which mm -hmm. I thought was, I didn't think that we were there yet, but is, I think we're getting a lot of, um, obviously we're getting barraged with information and some of it's politically driven. Sure. Uh, I know, I know, I don't want to make this about politics, but uh, you know, the, the damage from the damage, to the economy, I think this morning's uh, or this week's job reports are indicating something like 12 or 13% unemployment. I mean, astonishing number for four weeks worth of damage. Um, you know, talk about the economic fallout and damage and possibly uh, uh, mortality issues there versus the response that we're doing. Oh, sure. No, that's the, uh, that's the other edge of this wicked sword uh, that we're tossing up in the air and trying to play with is um, – you know, I, I fairly constantly invoke the notion that my industry, uh, which is the industry of everyone on this phone as well, you know, we were not on firm footing going into this thing. And so uh, we were already contemplating layoffs and, uh, you know, the stuff we deal with day in and day out in the oil patch. Uh, we were already there. And there's no question. Uh, let, me, let me give a couple examples on how this plays out. Um, part, of, part of my portfolio uh, in this volunteer gig uh, is mental health and behavioral health as well. And so we've been rightly focused on, uh, you know, the, the physical health that comes from fighting off a virus. Uh, but behind closed doors right now, it's unquestionable uh, that things like uh, depression um, and, and regrettably uh, social dynamics like uh, child abuse, uh, they are all up. You can't expect to alter pathways of activity across an entire society uh, and not have that happen. And if I think about child abuse in particular, um, you know, people are not out, uh, kids are not at school where, uh, you know, where the marks of child abuse can be seen. They're not in restaurants where, you know, people can see that happening. And regrettably, uh, there are, there are uh, unintended consequences of what we have to do. We had to lock down in the way that we did if we intended to stop the spread, but it doesn't, it's not a cost-free proposition. Uh, and I would suggest there's some people uh, by virtue of what we had to do uh, that are going to, you know, they're going to suffer in other ways. Uh, you know, we know alcoholism is up. Uh, we know that uh, depression's up. And so part of what I think we, we're starting to do right now is to address those um, unintended and probably unavoidable consequences of the action that was required. But the other part of that is economic. And, uh, you know, uh, we are taking this, believe me, uh, we're taking this deadly seriously with respect to uh, mitigating the viral spread. Uh, but there is a real, you know, there is a real economic impact uh, to folks. And the fact that 80% of us who get the virus uh, will have mild symptoms and many won't have symptoms at all. Um, that is a, that's the other side of the reality of this. And, uh, uh, and the economic prospects, uh, we often think about, you know, the, the single parent uh, who loses uh, his or her job in the process here, it's a real economic impact that can last 
for years and years and years. And so uh, I wouldn't suggest that any of this is easy. Uh, I would suggest that we're thinking about both components of that, the economic as well as the physical. It feels like we've start, started to get a hold on the physical spread of the virus and that reflects in our curve. And that's why uh, we've already begun thinking, okay, how do we re-energize the economy? How do we come out of this where we're not jumping from a flat-footed standpoint? And so I know it's, uh, we'll get, there'll be plenty of criticism of too early, too much, too soon as a return to the economy. Uh, we're ready for that. It's, it's part of how this thing works. Uh, and I know the governor is, he's, he's ready to take the criticism in respect of, uh, of trying to get folks uh, back on an economic uh, health pattern as well as, uh, as a physical health pattern. Well, you know, he, uh, Governor Stead has uh, have shown uh, leadership by, you know, listening to, you know, the economic, the economic engine for the state is, is the oil and gas industry. That's not a secret, but yeah, he listened to us. He, we, we felt like that uh, uh, a must thing that he did was the stabilization fund. Boy, he's looking pretty smart right now, guys. I'm, I'm just telling you, uh, we're, uh, we're going to have to tighten our belt as a state, just like every, uh, Every company, uh, whether whatever uh, <clears throat> across our entire value chain in the energy business, uh, we're we're what would you? Some of the things that we're trying to do is to reach out to our folks, provide uh, resources, uh, you know, especially uh, looking for a new job or or a new training. Uh, we're working working toward that. Uh, but what else would you tell us uh, during this time? Um, and it, are there going to be programs, you know, in addition to the SBA program and some of some of the, the federal things? But are there going to be Oklahoma-led programs to to help our folks here? Yeah, we've been talking a ton about that. Uh, the feds can do a lot. They've got a big checkbook, and you know, PPP and the SBA loans uh, are, are clearly going to help. Uh, you know, they're, they're clearly going to help. But you know, we had interestingly, Dave, we were talking about. What do we do about the oil field jobs? 150,000 direct jobs, you know, a quarter million that are second order. We were talking about this back in December, January, uh, long before COVID hit our shores. And, and what do we do, especially for some of the, you know, the service jobs that, uh, you know, given the step changes that we know are occurring in our business, uh, that those, you know, some of those aren't coming back, right? We're not just in a down cycle. Some of those are uh, structurally jeopardized. So fortunately, we were already thinking about what do the pivots look like uh, for the oil field workers um, before any of this started. So I think we're at, we at least have a running start. Uh, fortunately, we're not just fighting this with uh, kind of the, the health cabinet and you know, science and technology. We already have commerce. Uh, you know, Lieutenant Governor Pinnell is deeply involved. So they've been working in the background uh, for weeks and weeks as we've been fighting kind of the, the viral part of this uh, catastrophe. Uh, they've been working to think, okay, where can we get people uh, back to work uh, if, for instance, some of these oil field jobs are in jeopardy, but also the restaurateurs, you know, they're, uh, it's not going to come back immediately, uh, especially for, uh, you know, our hourly workers. And so what do you do about that? Uh, I'd say tons of Tons of work is going into that from the state level. We got to innovate. We've done it before, um, but we can't rely on uh, you know when oil peaks back up or we get any breathing room at all on the on the price of the natty gas. We can't we can't rely on that. Uh, and I think we as an industry know that. Um, so as a state, we got to respond like we've like we and we've done it before. Um, and I think that paths toward light manufacturing. Uh, you know this this COVID crisis has revealed a lot and. Uh, and if I could riff a second uh, more at the risk of at the risk of rambling on, I was on a run this morning and I thought about, okay, what did the oil field do to prepare me to sit in this chair? Now I will tell you when I when I signed on for this gig, um, it was it was funny because you know an oil field guy was going to be the secretary of health, so that had its own uh, sort of uh, comedy about it. But no kidding in the context of a worldwide pandemic of the type no one's ever seen. What is it about the oil field that prepared me to sit here? So I was thinking about that while I was running with the dog this morning. And I thought I would just share a couple of thoughts around that. So <clears throat> uh, 
everyone at this point uh, is familiar with personal protective equipment. You know, and my, my 11 year old may not get much of an education this semester, but he knows nouns, verbs, and N95 masks, right? Those are the three parts of speech. Um, and so as I'm thinking about N95 masks, early on when it came time, uh, we could see what was happening on both of the coasts. We could see they were overwhelmed. And uh, I will say my, my experience in the oil field um, on things that go tight quickly. Uh, I mean, if we think, uh, you know, if we think 2040 sand, right? If we think, uh, uh, if we think high spec tubulars, you know, these are things we're used to in the oil field. We are used to a hyper cyclical market where things immediately go short. And we're used to a global supply chain that can constrict in a moment and leave you high and dry. And so that felt like very familiar territory as we were watching what's happened on both of the coasts. And I would say um, that the team, not me, but the team reacted very quickly uh, to this and said, hey, we got to we can't follow a normal supply chain government buying process here. Uh, that's not going to work because we will have frontline workers who are without PPE. Uh, and another thing that the oil field has taught me is you get that stuff lined out pronto, um, stuff that protects people's lives. And here I think about uh, H2S monitors uh, are the co-equivalent of an N95 mask. Uh, you don't send a hand out without an H2S monitor. We don't send a nurse in without an N95 mask. You don't do it. Uh, it's, a, it's a moral obligation as much as it is uh, an economic uh, or procedural choice. So very early on, uh, we said, we're not going to uh, sort of play by the normal acquisition uh, models and you know, wait for a long time for a PO to be cut, et cetera. So I asked the governor for that permission uh, to you know, jump the line because regrettably, and I think this will be part of the postmortem after we finish all this. You know, regrettably, we have Oklahoma competing against Arkansas, uh, competing against Iowa. Um, we're a small state in the middle of the country. We didn't we didn't have much powder uh, to shoot with. But very early on, uh, I think there was a recognition. And again, I think this comes in part from our oil field experience. Hey, you got to you got to get after this stuff now. Uh, and I was given the opportunity to. Uh, leverage what happened, you know, the, the existing resources within uh, the State Department of Health, but I was also given broader latitude uh, and I could appoint someone. And so when it was time to grab someone to, to be the point person on masks, uh, I got a guy from the oil field um, and I got a dude who has bought, uh, you know, into the supply chain from places like China uh, and we just got after it. And so one thing that the oil field had prepared me for was to deal with uh, a constricted supply chain that you have to buy from international markets. Uh, I, I felt ready in that respect. Uh, are we there from a PPE standpoint? Hardly. And we deal with it all the time. But right now, uh, it's not a procurement issue. It's a logistics issue. So what else did the oil field prepare us for? Uh, it was logistics. We know how to move stuff around. And so very early on, when UPS and FedEx and DHL could no longer uh, move equipment, this equipment that we had sourced in China, we immediately started sourcing space on uh, charters. Uh, and I don't, I wouldn't suggest we're the first to do that, but we were really quick into it. Uh, and I think that's made a substantial difference on where we stand with respect to uh, the PPE. Um, we're used to 24 seven ops in our business. Uh, that oil field resilience, that oil field resilience permeate, the oil field resilience uh, permeates the entire state. We, you know, yeah. one in six of the folks uh, here are connected or, or work in the oil and gas industry. You know, I, I like I like that. I like drawing that conclusion because I think it's true. Uh, we get stuff done. I mean, uh, yeah. we can we rally? We get stuff done. That's that's in Oklahoma's DNA. I'm glad we got a a, um, a an oil and gas guy help, helping out and running running it like yourself. And, and a understanding and, and a, another guy that gets stuff done uh, with, with uh, Kevin Stead. So we're very excited about hopefully getting back to work and, and uh, uh, hope, hopefully uh, sooner than later. But uh, man, I tell you what, Jerome, we sure appreciate you being on here and, and giving us this information. Uh, you mentioned uh, as you roll out this, uh, the timeline for things, 
uh, it would be helpful. We're going to direct uh, uh, a lot of our folks uh, to the governor's uh, uh, daily executive order order reports. Hopefully, y'all will include those timelines, uh, some of that in your in your rhetoric, with other than just the raw data, uh, and and continue. We'll direct people there, uh, and as well as the Atlantic. Um, magazine drip and national because I can see how actually it's a litmus of how well we're doing versus versus other states I, I can't I, I'm, I'm 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 very proud of what you guys are doing and I'm very proud of our folks we're, we're not we got a long way to go uh, we're, we're going to lose a significant amount of people and one of the things that concerns us the most or should concern us the most is is our best and brightest young people uh, we'll start doubting whether or not they can have a career in, in oil and gas, and they go, "Well, I'm going to do a tech job or something." Well, there's not a bit, there's not more cutting technology than in the oil and gas world, and, and uh, every chance you get to tell uh, the, the commerce secretary or anybody there, we need industry that uses natural gas. Uh, our natural gas leaves our borders like a third world country where values added. We need to build stuff here. And it starts with the schools, and Governor Stitt knew that, and he, he attacked the schools. So, I think I think uh, we could come out of this, yeah, stronger. And and we're showing our strength right now. So I'm gonna let you have the final word, Jerome. I know I'm a proud uh, proud not only for, he's a I'm I'm a proud Duncan Demon as well. We're both Duncan Demons, and uh, very very excited to have you on the show and let you close it up for us. Yeah, well, my encouragement for. Uh for all the oil field, it's keep your chin up. Um, I think we're, we're winning this battle against the virus and that's because people have taken personal responsibility and I appreciate what I know everyone on the phone has done. It's showing up in the numbers. That's, that's the first phase of the war. But the second phase is let's go win this economic battle. And uh, no one's better positioned than our industry to do that and to lead the way for Oklahoma. Um, so if there were ever a call on leadership, uh, it's right now. And so my encouragement is to, uh, to all the people on the phone who have made this happen time and time again, uh, who have come back when it seemed like it wasn't possible, who have emerged out of, uh, of troughs, uh, hey, now's our time. So let's lead well, uh, lead your folks well, encourage them to be safe, uh, but encourage them optimistically uh, that we've, uh, we've done this before and uh, the character of Oklahomans and the character of the oil patch uh, will get through this. Um, keep our head about us. Uh, and uh, and we'll be we'll be a okay. But hey, I sure appreciate uh, you letting me uh, visit today, Dave. It was a it was an encouragement to me. We're going to go uh, keep things going for the rest of the day here. Uh, but uh, but I just appreciate getting to share some of the thoughts uh, from our uh, from our command center here. I'd let uh, people know that next week's show uh, we're going to have the good folks from Phillips Murrow are going to come on and talk about labor and employment law in navigating through. Uh, some of the changes, especially the changes involving uh, COVID-19. And, and uh, I think it'll be another very informative and very timely uh, presentation for our folks. So, hey guys, uh, we're, look, we're, uh, we're gonna make it through this. So hang in there. Thanks, Jerome. Thanks, Dave.